Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. Hey, everyone. Before we get started with the show, I'm excited to announce two things. First is that my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed, is now live on Amazon. So go get it. The second thing is we have a new sponsor, Qualified.com. I'm going to tell you about them in the next couple seconds here and also how you can get a free copy of my book thanks to them. So who are these people? Well, Qualified is the number one live chat and chatbot platform for Salesforce and Pardot. Sales reps can have real-time, personalized conversations with who? Your hottest website visitors. So I want you to know, I don't just partner with anyone. I genuinely love these guys, and the platform, we use it at my company. Our sales team loves it. We've closed a lot of deals based on it, Um, had a lot of great conversations with prospects too. So, you know, a lot of marketing these days is, what, hurry up and wait right? Fill out this form. And then if we pass you over to sales, maybe you'll swap six emails with them to find a good time to talk. But what if a prospect is doing research right now and they would chat now? Why not give them the opportunity? So the best part is your company actually decides what leads are worth a live chat. There's a lot of noise out there. You don't want to talk to everyone. So Qualified actually connects to Salesforce and Pardot and it's able to pull in lead and contact information so you can specifically know if you're talking to a VIP, a VP, a decision maker. It's really kind of like magic. Now, if you don't know who someone is, well, what happens then, Casey? Well, that's when the bots come in handy. Chat bots can then ask you know, questions to further qualify a lead. Find out if maybe this is someone you do want to talk to. And they can book meetings while your sales team is out. And they can wake up the next morning with a bunch of meetings on their calendar. Now, here's the promo. If you are a company that wants to give your sales team this ability, right, to be able to talk to decision makers right when they're on your website, do this. Go to qualify.com and start a chat, right? They use their own tool, of course. Start a chat. Tell them that Casey sent you. If you have Salesforce Pardot, when you schedule and then do a demo, they will send you a free copy of my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed. Not bad, right? Well, it's only while supplies last. So, Hop on this thing today. And that's it for sponsors. Let's get to the show. There it is. And we get to record live from the Studio B in my coronavirus bunker in my home. Hey, welcome, everyone. Today's guest is super exciting. I want to introduce him. The birds of a feather. There's a lot of technical expertise here, and he brings that to bear in the marketing world. He is at that intersection of marketing and technology. Um, with a background in both. He's a leader in the industry, in the communications field. He's a thought leader in the marketing space, podcasting, webinars. Uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Telco Bridges, Alan Percy. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm I'm, uh, hunkered down in my home office here in uh, Orchard Park, New York, and uh, doing our best to try to stay sane. Let's put it that way. Yes. How's the TP situation? You good? Uh, we're we're locked and loaded. We're good to go for a while. It's just <laughs> my me, just my wife and I, and we we're we're set for a while. Oh, awesome, awesome, good to hear. Well, with that said, now I guess we can continue because we've got the the bare essentials covered. Basics. Well, you forgot <laughs> to ask the question about how's the wine supply holding up. That's how, the problem. How is the wine supply holding up? You know, we might have to resort to drinking, drinking a couple of those bottles of uh, rosé that somebody dropped off at a party. Oh. I don't know. It's getting, we're getting thin. Well, rosé time is one thing, but as long as it's not yellowtail, because <laughs> then you know it's the <laughs> end of the world. <laughs> That's right. The end is near. Yeah. Right. Come to find out the CMO of Yellowtail is listening to this like, I was a fan. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. Yeah, nope. Yeah, nope. Right. Not anymore. Yep. Lost that lost that listener. But yep. um, you know, we're here. It's our marketing leadership series, getting to pick your brain and learn from you. Um, so one of the things I want to do is just pass you this thing. It's an imaginary Thor's hammer. There's actually yes. a real one in the office, but it's probably covered in coronavirus. So passing you Thor's hammer here. Take okay. that hammer and smash for me some kind of marketing myth, bogus strategy, misconception yep. that drives you crazy. Yep. 
Well, um, as we were talking in the prep, uh, was leading up to this, um, my path, my career path, um, started as a software developer, and I slowly went through sort of the product management, and eventually ended up being responsible for a much wider scope within marketing. Uh, and the side effect of that is I, um, I've, I can connect with a lot of the CEOs that I've worked with that have um, started out as engineers themselves. And nice. I've noticed this pattern. Um, one of the things that um, a lot of a, a lot of engineering background CEOs, um, at least in my experience, have had is um, thinking like an engineer. They think of marketing as like a giant electrical circuit, which is mm. where if I put you know a bias voltage on this input, uh, and then uh, money goes in here, then results should come out here, and then you know the amount of latency between the inputs and the outputs. Um, should be measured in microseconds, and um, it's it's a challenge to work with technical uh, CEOs or you know with an engineering background, which is true with a lot of the as you can imagine a lot of the startups is to have them understand that you know that marketing is not an electrical circuit. Um, mm -hmm. You're dealing with people's emotions. You're dealing with people's feelings and uh, um, their their thoughts about um, security and safety and is this a wise decision? And those things are not necessarily engineering decisions. Um, you're dealing with a much broader thing. And it's been a learning experience for me too. So the trick, what I've sort of discovered in, in working with this is um, you have to use language to, um, for the engineering folks that they understand, right? This is, you know, your KPIs and, you know, the number of marketing qualified leads and sales qualified leads. Those are all very important but helping set expectations about, you know, we're going to do these activities and these activities will slowly start to move um, the needle, you know, like charging a capacitor kind of thinking that right. you know, we're building up goodwill with our customers and you put it in terms that they can understand. And in a lot of those cases, I think that they feel a lot more comfortable and I've discovered they feel a lot more comfortable. And um, the second thing I think is we were chatting about was, is, Using marketing automation is one of the key elements in in providing a framework that has those metrics in it that they can go and look at. And they can see when we run a webinar, they can see the traffic um, from the webinar. They can see the new prospects that arrive into our Pardot database. They can see nice. uh, the YouTube views spike. They can see the web page um, um, views spike. Um, showing that you know that, that that you know that input, the effort that was made, um, produces some output. Now, obviously, you know, then also talking about you know seven touches to the customer and all these other kinds of things to move someone from a marketing qualified lead to a sales qualified lead to eventually to a customer right. um, is uh, all part of the puzzle. So, kind Absolutely. of there was something that was going to smash with that is is trying to smash through that barrier of thinking that just because I put money in, I should immediately get leads. And, and, and that, that's a pervasive thinking that's hard to get over. Yeah. The circuit mindset, the, yeah. in the you mentioned, you know, the latency should be small. The idea that the loss um, on the circuit should be barely even noticeable without the right. strongest of measurements. Right. Actually, it's kind of more irrational. It's like the most irrational, I don't know, dark matter science yes. that you could possibly imagine yep. because people are making these irrational decisions and then sometimes justifying them with the rationale yep. comes after it. But you're right. We're dealing with humans that <laughs> don't necessarily always respond the same way you think they would. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It's a big piece of it. It's a big piece of it. And then we kind of go another area that I've kind of been um, you know, giving consideration to um, for us is, um, you know, last couple of companies we work for have obviously very constrained marketing budgets, and yeah. um, I would have, you know, I, every marketer would love to work for a company that they just throw, you know, millions of dollars at you and say, "Go for it," you know. Yeah. And I always am kind of jealous when I go to some, you know, there are some firms in our space who I don't know where they got the money from, but they just go bananas. Um, but we've got always that VC got, funding, right? They got that. Yes, yeah, that's that VC sweet funding. VC cash. Yep. Yeah, the angel funders or something. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's not something that's been part of my experience, and so we've had to come up with uh, marketing strategies that have been very, very cost effective. And and what two uh, there's a couple of things that we've done, um, especially this last couple of years at Telco Bridges that I've done with them that seem to really make a big difference. One of them is 
um, we made a decision to take an early version of the product and to give it away, basically use the freemium business model, just, okay. just start to build a pipeline of people who are interested in uh, our kind of software. So we, we branded and started to offer a free session border controller software package and we and we started to promote it and as expected you know we we got quite a few takers to give the free software a try right uh and that started to build uh you know a, a community right that we could then go back to when we had a more complete more full feature software so that freemium business model seemed to really really pay off because it really didn't cost us much because the software was mostly done um, and if anyone's going to be serious about using it, they're probably going to want to upgrade to the professional version down the road. So right. we just gave it a shot and it worked spectacularly. I have to admit that the second element well, well, was, so, well, go um, ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So freemium model, was there some concern getting into it that we're just giving this thing away? Oh, there was, concern? yeah. Gobs of concern. Yeah. Gobs of concern. And honestly, one of the biggest concerns was in, if we give the software away, um, are we setting people's expectations correct about how we're going to support them? Right. So we had to be crystal clear with the messaging. that This is, you know, this is supported through community support. It's, it's not, um, the general public does not have a perception that they can just call our support line and get hours and hours of support on a free software package. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What happens when it yeah. doesn't work, but you want them to be successful with it, but you Correct. can't spend a bunch of time with them on. Correct. Correct. Stuff. However, right. There are certain accounts who step forward and when we would see them go by in the downloads, we said, that's a strategic account, um, call uh -huh. them and, and, and offer them a free five hour package or something like that of service to help them get started because we think that they're strategically important and Smart. then it's it's not only have you set their expectations moderately but you've also exceeded their expectations right out of the shoe and so that that seemed to help significantly yeah like a little oprah moment you get support you get support you get support <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah that's smart yeah. And it's yeah. not everybody you're being strategic about it picking some accounts out of the mix and correct making yep. their day that's exactly the, exactly the strategy. Did and then, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and then I was going to say, and then we moved um, to, okay, now we need to nurture people, right? We got this yeah. list of people who've downloaded this free software or who are tire kicking or maybe, you know, they've moved along uh, and, they're, and they're starting to kind of hover around our messaging. And now we need to start nurturing them. And right. we've, I've always been amazed by the power of webinars, self-hosted webinars, yeah. Um, and we started a monthly webinar series back when we first launched this um, this product, um, and and we've gotten very good at, at executing these things. Myself and our marketing communications um, uh, person in, in the organization, um, every month we crank one out, crank one out. We're bringing guests, and what we do is we we find alliance partners, we find people who need our software, who've leveraged the software, we have them join us as a guest. And the side effect of this is now we not only are sharing our story to our community, but we're sharing the story to their community, and we're actually getting more people to join our community through this Alliance um, partner, partner webinar series. And it's just month after month. And in the beginning, it was hard. It was hard to get people to join, and we had to kind of talk them into it, uh, bend, you know, twist their arm a little bit to have them join and tell their story. Um, but frankly, now, 25 months into it, um, pe people are lined up. They, they can't wait to get on it because they know by joining our alliance and joining these events that they're going to get access to a section of our, our community, right? Because they're going to have a registration list for the event that they'll have access to new people and conversely will get access to the part of their community. And this just keeps going, 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 going. And the curve like of that. our new prospects just evenly just goes up and up and up as we go. So it's, and it costs almost nothing. It costs True. the cost of a Zoom subscription. Right. So it's just some time, right? And yeah. And doing some post-production and some time um, to be able to do it. But um, well, well, question for you. It makes sense if you've got a partner that's joining you, especially if they're promoting it to their audience, you're doing that cross-promotional marketing. Right. How do you ensure that, that your viewers, your customers are getting value because I know sometimes sure. partners can come in and just go crazy with their pitch, you know, or yes. have just the most right. boring partner webinar ever. <laughs> How do you keep things to where people continue to want to join them? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the, the key really has to be is um, the prep work, right? You, you can't obviously just, and this is one of the mistakes I see like at trade shows, for example, they, you know, they let somebody, they give them a, you know, 15 minute time slot in a, in a, in a conference session and they get up there and they just, just all they do is just do their pitch. You know, it starts so with gross. the four, who are we slides? And yeah. then it just goes into a pure pitch. And I, I always make sure when we sit down with the, the customer or the partner that, you know, there's a specific use case we're going to talk about here. There's a challenge or a problem in the market. And let's talk about that first. And then let's talk about how to solve it. And so this how to is a critical piece of what makes it searchable and have value and get legs on YouTube, you know, down downstream. So it gets to be a long tail uh, recording. It's right. just got to be some how to content. So this is not just, you know, how to buy our stuff, but instead it's how to solve this problem. And let's, let's make sure that the content's about that. And then sometimes I got to be honest with some of the Alliance partners, I have kind of got it rough with them and say, no, 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 you're not doing a product pitch here. Mm. We're, we're trying to teach, we're trying to teach people how to solve a specific problem. And, and, I just want to take that one step further because wrangling vendors to make sure you're serving your audience, it, are there certain questions you – like how do you set that relationship up for success? The expectations with that partner because you're just going to do this webinar together or that customer, this webinar together. You don't want them to right. pitch. Are there certain things you ask them to answer or address? How do you – because yeah. crafting that show is like really that's the magic. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. So, how do you, how do you um, kind of keep it within the guardrails? As I yeah. as I like to say, is um, I, I a lot of times uh, sometimes I'll point into some of the past events that we've done and Smart, and yeah. or when if we first start talking about it, I say, let me just tell how these work. Generally, what happens is you know we talk about a challenge for the first third, and then this next third is we talk about how to solve it. And then at the end, I leave you some time to talk about your product that goes with it. Um, because I, I know when I watch the viewership and you watch over timeline, people listen to the beginning. You know, you obviously, you have the maximum viewership at the beginning of the event. And then you get about a, a third of the way down, you lose a little bit. And then you get another third of the way, you lose a little bit more. And that's a pattern that I can see in the viewership history. So, true. Yeah. so that by telling them the how-to before you get to the halfway point or the two-thirds point, you kind of got the message across. And then at that point, you've delivered the knowledge, the education part of the story. So that then, you know, they'll probably come back and listen to the, you know, the, the pitch, maybe if they really were curious or not. And about a third of the people will stick around and listen to the, to the pitch at the end because they want to hear the Q&A. Right. Right. And what I think happens a lot of cases is that they, you know, they listen to the beginning part live and then they come back later and they listen on the recording. We're religious about the recordings go out the next day always like clockwork they're always on youtube we try to get them to subscribe to our youtube channel and by listening to that recording that's usually the what they skip to the to the um q a because they want to hear the q a there's a lot of value usually in that for them and so people have grown to really get some value out of that q a and they actually stick around to get to that part that part right the, exactly exactly because wow. there's got to be some magic at the end that's worth sticking around for so right Maybe I'm giving away all my secrets here. I don't know. That's the I, hey, welcome <laughs> to the show, Al. Yeah, That's fantastic. Exactly. Don't give them all away, but I, yeah, I think don't give them all away. Particular topic. Yeah. You're right. Webinars, and it's it's very timely to right now too. Yes. Because right. There are there are no conferences. You know, there it's are no conferences. Right. Virtual, That's and if you're true. comfortable in that virtual space, but to your point, if you created a show, if you created a format that delivers value, that's awesome. I think sometimes people, I'm mean, I've been part of webinars that were terrible they were boring yeah. and yep. they were self-serving and uh, it's yep. gross um but th yep. this sounds interactive and lively recordings go out the next day and you like the idea of youtube to try yes. to build that subscriber channel are you yeah are you to do that versus like one of those tools like a wistia or a vidyard sure YouTube? sure yeah no it's interesting um matter of fact a previous engagement we, we made a decision uh, a few years ago, like four years ago, we did made a decision that we didn't, we weren't just going to give the content away that instead we were going to use Wistia. We actually did use Wistia. And the, um, the strategy was um, to, um, to try to measure everything, right. To measure yeah. um, not only the live event, but I wanted to measure, you know, who was watching the recordings and how many minutes and how long, and then 
push all that into the mark into then that particular account was in HubSpot, and it, so we could use um, yeah. HubSpot to track all this. And so we could say if you watched more than twenty minutes of the recording, then you, you know you earned so many points in uh, HubSpot um, sure. to you know continue the qualification process. Um, th this particular situation, we kind we kind of decided that the search. Uh, and the social part of YouTube was more valuable to us than it, than necessarily knowing how many minutes they watched. So um, it's a different strategy. It was, uh, admittedly, it was probably kind of bold, right, to just say, you know what? Yeah. Um, we're not going to use one of the, you know, the Wistia type of, of platforms and stuff. We're going to just throw it out on YouTube. And, and you're absolutely right. When somebody searches for one of the, you know, we have to be very careful about the titles of the events so that they search really well. So when they search for the term and they watch that video, we have no idea who it is. But we, but by sprinkling some links in the videos, you know, you can hopefully get somebody over to your your library of other content and get right. them to identify themselves as to who they are. Um, Do you get the and, sense that that's working? It's worth that. I mean, you, to your point, not everything's a computer chip. Not everything's a an, an electrode, or you know, you can't <laughs> exactly. measure everything. So it sounds like you yeah, read yourself yep. from, I mean, YouTube stats or whatever they are, you know, kind of just. Right, like, right. And half right. the views are me, you know, yep. looking, at, looking yep. at our video. So. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it's a little bit of a Hail Mary, right? Yeah. It's, um, it's something that's new, for, you know, especially this last couple of years of this, this series. We've just kind of said, well, let's give it a shot. Let's throw it out there and see what, um, what comes of it. And, um. Admittedly, I would love to know for every one of these videos that we push out, you know, exactly who watched it, how many minutes they watched it, where did they stop, where do they start, right. insert, you know, um, gates in the middle of the video. Yeah, those are really, it. really, yeah, those are really cool tools. Um, but, you know, we just kind of made a strategic decision that, you know, let's just, let's build, make people feel comfortable. And then, um, especially, uh, honestly, the, the community we've been dealing with, um, with this particular software package is a, there's a lot of open source folks in the community. Yeah. And you throw you throw a lead scrape gate up in front of anything and they will not go through. You know, yeah, they're very principle, resistant right? to that. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. So You know, uh, do you have other things that are gated or for this particular company and market and audience you're going more of that freemium ungated? Yeah, so we do we have uh, other content that's gated. Um, we for example, we'll take all the analyst reports uh, you know, the high value analyst reports, um, those we've got gated. Uh, we, um, we also gated, we call it the video library, which is a neatly, nicely organized collection of, of videos. And some of those videos that are in the video library are not um, visible. You know, they're unlisted on YouTube. Um, and so by structuring that and putting a gate in front of that, and when we promote the video library, they have to go through a gate to get to, to the library. Even though, I'll tell you the truth, 80% of that's right on YouTube. They could just go to YouTube and yeah. find it. But you'd be surprised. No, no people, listening. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but you'd be surprised. People go through, you know, they, they fill in the information and go through the gate. Yeah. Um, and that just helps us know, you know, who's coming, who, what are they looking at. Um, uh, but again, you know, we still, the big, the big thing is the, is the freemium software. That's where, that's, you know, they come to download the software. There's a big gate on that one. There's a lot yeah. of qualifying questions on that gate. And that's um, that is you know that's the primary place of where new, new you know uh, MQLs come from. Got it. Because you're offering something of so much value. It's it's right. it's not a white paper. It's like it's software. No, and we're talking you know we're talking a couple hundred megabytes of software is going to download as soon as it hits submit. <laughs> so, so you're asking the questions up front to find yes. out how. And to your point, if you want to identify them as one of those ones you want to go after, yep, offer a little yep. bit more to. Yep. Do you ever get anyone just going crazy on that form and saying that they have like a billion? Just yeah. To try to well, you know, it's funny. We, we get um. There's a couple of guys out there that are a a a a a at a a a dot com. You know, but we, you know, the the yeah. form screens a lot of that crap out and sort of right. says, "Come on, dude, please." You know, you need a real email address, and they'll throw up a you know temporary email address. I mean, if you fiddle with it, but the software expires if they don't come and renew it, and so you know, it's, yeah. It's if somebody's not willing to identify themselves, then probably not a real prospect anyhow. Exactly. Not at that point, time. college kid or something like that, whatever, it doesn't bother us. Right. 
So. And hey, good on them. Maybe they, you should go right to HR. If you're you're a college kid and you're downloading our couple hundred megabytes of uh, software <laughs> on your on your free time, then yeah. we probably should talk. We should. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah. the in, the reason the freemium came up is because we were talking about things that had that high return for a low spend. Right. Knowing that you have to really get in there, target, get efficient. I've heard freemium model webinars. Anything else in, in your your power pack? Yeah, so we um we've dabbled with a couple of media types too, right? So we did some um, podcasts for uh, um, last year. We did a collection of them, and we're do, trying to do them on a regular basis. Um, that's str- we're struggling with just allocating the time to do some yeah. of those the podcasts. But we do them. We do them with some of the media outlets. We do them. Obviously, we're spending a lot of time with you here today. Yeah. Uh, we, we've all got our own little, um, podcast channel. We call the uh, telecom disruptors. And the idea nice. with that was to find people who've done something that's really disrupted the market and, yeah. and, and to interview them, um, to kind of memorialize. This is almost kind of a personal project for me. I, 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 I worry there's enough of the guys in our industry, you know, we change in the telecommunication space. If you go back 20 years ago, you know, it would cost you 50 cents a minute to call, um, across country. Heaven forbid you wanted to call London or England or Israel. You know, it was crazy expensive right. you know, 30 years ago. So in this last you know, generation, we've converted from that to everything's basically free, completely changed um, the telecommunications industry, gone from a voice-only experience to obviously this multi-party video uh, collaboration environment. Um, and there's people that made this happen. There are key people in this process that made this all come to fruition. So we wanted to capture some of their stories before they got on their sailboat and disappeared over the sunset. Right, <laughs> some, right, right. some of these people made a crap load of money, or they just said, "I'm done. I'm out." You know, they're um, knocking on sixty some odd years old and they're done. So I just thought it would be fun to capture these people. I've got you know a personal network of folks in this industry, and so we started this podcast. It's been a lot of fun, and um, we have some good giggles. And one of the last ones we just did with. Um, one of the leaders in the open source space. Um, we tried doing it in a, just a little something different. We tr- um, jumped in the car together and he was um, actually giving me a ride to the airport hmm. in London. And we had this great conversation of uh, geeks and cars. So we uh, really just trying something different, you know, just yeah. to kind of stir things up. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. I, I enjoy podcasting too. Um, and I think sometimes it's the relationships you get out of it um, yeah. as well well as you know you hope people are listening learning the branding but to your point it's, it's probably the least trackable other than radio advertising right but at least maybe you can target right. geos with that it, it's it's so hard to really pinpoint an actual roi in a lot of cases right, right. yep another thing i by the way i jotted down something i wanted to um, just yeah. throw in here too is yeah, yeah. Um, trade show prep you know we we do a handful of trade shows every year and this is in, in, in our industry has got a handful of repeats and one of the things i see it, it just it makes it makes my blood boil sometimes is to watch people go to a trade show who've not prepped for it mm. you know, they've not reached out to the customers they've not set up meetings they've not prepared a calendar or schedule they've not looked at the conference schedules and figured out there's a couple of sessions that i want to use to improve myself um instead they just show up unprepared um and it's just a you know giant cash burn for the for the marketing team um and i you know for the last i don't know how many years since i've been responsible for doing uh, managing trade shows for the last um, 15 years have just tried so hard to help set um, the, those that are participating in a trade show as an exhibitor to have a plan, you know, I will, we will want to see a list of who's, who are you going to be meeting with? How do you, you know, who have you reached out to? It's not always just up to marketing to set the meetings up. The salespeople who are attending these events need to schedule of meetings, um, publish the schedule to the marketing people so we can have, um, a conference room ready for them or have the right material in a folder ready for them. So when right. they arrive, there's a name, their name is on a folder, right? Ooh. Of the material that's ready for them so that they feel welcome. And if you say, you know what, this guy's a big espresso um, person, I, I, you know, I can have an espresso ready to go. Those, those kinds of things. Oh, I love that. So, you know, being prepared, especially this big, big expensive trade shows, one of the big ones in our industry is called Mo World Congress, which they canceled this year. 
um, you know, it's 109,000 people uh, at an event and it's, you know, it's a hundred and some odd thousand dollars just for the space. Yeah. And, you know, every meeting counts and maximizing the efficiency and the time of everybody that's there is so critically important because it's so expensive. Um, so having, you know, a routine to prep everybody f for the event, uh, you know, the salespeople and the marketing people that are going to the event is critically important. And, um, can make make or break a budget. Yeah, so for for a lot of companies, that's that's the big spend. Yeah, you know, it is. You go, you go is. crazy. The the booth. If you got a booth, even if you don't have a booth, you're and if you're sending like eight people there, yep. and especially if you get those badges. I don't I don't know how it is um, for Mobile World Congress, but like sometimes even just to attend is expensive. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Some of the um, some of the conferences. Um, you know, we've, we've figured out ways of using some of our alliances, which is another use for the alliances too, by the way, right. To find a, you know, a way to keep the costs under control. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, it could be, it could be a thousand dollars a person to just walk a show. Um, I know. Right. And, and uh, what are you doing with a thousand bucks? You know, wh what's the plan? Who are you going to meet with? How are you reaching out to these people? And, and, you know, the marketing folks could do that broad umbrella kind of scatter shot. Right. Hey, we're going to the event. Hey, this is what we got going. Hey, this is don't miss this session. Don't miss this new demo that we're doing in the event or something like that. But when it comes right down to it, you want to have, you know, want to have meetings with prospects and customers because this is one of the rare times you might have the CEO, you might have the product management people, you might have uh, the account manager all in the same spot with the account. So why not make it into a really high quality meeting, uh, dinner meeting or um, an afternoon, you know, um, visit at the bar, whatever, just to maximize it. That's the thing. Absolutely. I love the idea of the alliances to keep it under control. Every meeting counts. It's like you're literally giving someone a thousand dollars in cash and you're like, okay, yeah. cool. What are we going to do with that? How are yeah, we going to make that exactly. into more? Exactly. You know, it's an investment. If, if you had to distill down like your, your top five, you know, ninja ways of preparing, yeah, the, the best ways to prepare for a conference um marketing and sales both whatever just the most powerful ways you can prepare what would, yeah. what would you say some of those might be i think well one of the things a lot of the conferences there are um guerrilla ways of getting to find out who's going to the event um that's one thing right so you can look at well first of all you can just look at who are the exhibitors and then you kind of match that up with your you know your prospect database okay yeah. So that's that's one obvious one. The other thing is you going through and trolling through, see who the speakers are, and then trying to match those up with you know who's in your database, who can you reach out to, um, and then you know you can you can troll people, right? Oh, you know I saw you know John Adams is going to be um, doing uh, you know a, a session on a particular topic. Go to LinkedIn, you know, um, say you know, connect with them. Say hey, you see you're going to the event. Um, you know, we're, we've got a lot of interest in that particular topic or space. Um, as long as you don't just do the cold LinkedIn, um, connect with me. I'm in your generic industry. We should be connected uh, Yeah. kind right. of email. If it's specific, you know, you, I see you're going to this event. We're going to be at the event too. We'd like to learn more about what your company does. Um, and you, and you start with that kind of, I'm on a receiving mode. You yeah. probably get an accept for the person, and then, and at that point, listen, listen. Do they have something yeah. of value that they can help you? And then conversely, then then respond with you know maybe there's a way you can help them. Um, and those those mechanisms you know generally lead to good relationships. Matter of fact, we just closed an account a few weeks ago that was born out of that kind of work. Really, um, and it's probably going to be one of our big, bigger significant customers. Exactly that kind of methodology. It was born out of the LinkedIn approach and the out of the CTO was speaking at a conference, and oh, so wow. I know he's going to be there. So if I stand at the back of the room uh, after you know doing the LinkedIn approach, and then stand at the back of the room and 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 introduce myself, right? Then you can uh, you know I think I think you got a problem I might be able to help you with kind yeah. of solution. Um, it it works. It works. Wow, and that but that prep made it not just you harassing him after he's done speaking. Right. Is right. oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, we uh, we yeah. Saw, we exchanged the messages. Right. Hey, great job. I yeah, really loved it. Yep. Let's get some coffee. Yep. You know. Yes, exactly. Right. right. Awesome. Those kinds of tools. Um, any other power tips in terms of the conference prep? 
I, I, so, I, I get the sense that like you are so far above a lot of other people in this yeah. that uh, there's got it. there's some the nuggets in there that I mean, yeah, they've already yeah, been coming yeah, out yeah. too. So. Right, right, right. So matter of fact, a young gal that I've been working with, um, trying to help her for a career things, friend of a friend kind of things. When um, yeah. we would chat about a couple things i said one of the things that she was getting into event management and i said um i'll tell you one thing i did you know some events management you know as you kind of work your way through this you obviously you do a little of everything right i said the number one thing is setting your team's expectations as an event manager setting expectations and then deliberately beating them right so the idea being is you develop a plan for the event you you have you, you understand exactly what's going to happen. You understand what pieces and moving parts there are, what the goals and objectives are of the event, and then you make sure that everybody who's participating in the event, whether directly or indirectly, right? Because there's sometimes mm-hmm. there's people who are hangers on, know exactly what's going to happen. Um, and I, I give you a couple stumbling blocks. For example, there was one scenario. There was one situation where there was a new global VP of sales and I was sending out these notes, you know, Hey, um, our our events person's got everything ready to go. You just need to go click on this link and register yourself for the event. Here's the code. It won't cost you anything, but you needed, you know, your food allergies and that kind of question that I can't answer for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, the new new senior VP of sales didn't, didn't do it and showed up. And of course there's no badge for him. Right. Right. So he's a little perturbed. Right. And it was kind of one of those, Ah, uh, I should have known better, right? But you do your best, right? You try to yep. help people know exactly with step one, step two, step three, exactly what they're supposed to be doing to um, make sure they know what is going to happen so that then when they get to the event, there's no surprise. And yeah. if anything, you you surprise them with something they didn't expect. Um you know, we had a little bit of money left over, so I hired the ice cream machine to come in our booth for the last day. Mm. wow we didn't know that you know it was just you know kind of a little, a little extra, extra surprise yeah yeah yep. i find so. the surprise the surprises are like to your point when you beat expectations it just it just creates a moment yeah yep exactly awesome so you know, yeah well, yeah go ahead yeah, I was just gonna say. So I've dug deep into my secret sauce. Uh, <laughs> I'm extracting all this here, Casey, yeah. knowledge from you. I've gone from a Padawan and soon to be a Jedi. Um, yeah. You know, the last question I had for you was around aligning with sales and marketing, and just yeah, probably the question overall in general, but also maybe even starting at the events and then sort right. of moving into how do you stay aligned overall with your right. That's a great question, and it, it, uh, we were kind of kicking this around um, a few days ago, but w- one. One area uh, I've uh, personally run into, and I saw a presentation at one of our conferences this last um, month. I'm trying to think of what, what month is it? This last month was I don't know, uh, about the importance yet? of aligning. I know, I know. Is, it, is this over yet? Yeah. It was about aligning um, the sales and marketing teams and um, the importance of trying to keep them uh, aligned. And, I, and as soon as I was going through this presentation, it's like, oh, my God, that's that's why – one of those previous relationships was just such a disaster um, because in that situation, um, the general marketing team reported up to a VP and then the VP would go to the um, sales call and would have maybe like five minutes um, to report sort of what's happening on a quarterly basis or something like that. It was like trivial overlap or communication. And, and in that situation, there was a lot of finger pointing. Well, you know, these leads all suck and you know how come no one's following up on these leads we did all this work we got all in this database and how come no one's calling on them? there's no notes in here you know this back and forth and back and forth so one of the things I, I made a conscious decision with the current engagement is is that every week there's a revenue call i'm on that call every week i listen to what's going on from the sales standpoint 90 percent of the time I, there's not much i can do to help them um, cause they're dealing with, you know, not having money or not having this, not having that. But at the end of the call, there's always, okay, let me tell you what's coming from marketing. Let me show you where we are in our plan. Let me show you what, what events to expect. Let me tell you the results from the event we just ran. This is what you can see when you're seeing these new leads trickle through, uh, through our part out in Salesforce database. This is why they, they showed up, you know? So you can have an intelligence conversation with these people. You know, you're you're not surprised by all of a sudden. Oh, oh, I didn't know we did that kind of thing. Right. 
And, so it's that, it's um, that chance to just, you're listening, you're learning, you're absorbing, but you just drop in a couple marketing nuggets at the end yep, of that every time. Yep, exactly, exactly. And that seems to drastically improve um, the relationship. There's there's far fewer surprises. There's a lot less of the finger pointing. Um, it's a much, much, much better relationship. And so I, I would encourage every organization that if there's a, you know, a periodic revenue or sales call, or whatever it is, is that there's a there's a marketing module at every one of them. You got to go quick. You got to make it simple. Don't get into all the KPIs and nitty gritties and stuff like that. But just um, show, tell them what's coming. Tell them what you just did, and to give them a new basically give them a new uh, arrow for their quiver. That's that's the key thing. Yeah. Okay. Got this new case study. Got a new white paper. We're putting up this new press release. Right. It's a new arrow for their quiver. New arrow. I like that putting arrows just giving them giving them some weapons giving them some yep. some yep. ammo every time that's cool yep. i like that yep. and the discipline of joining that call and you know serving another team as opposed to just always being about yourself but then at the end dropping some ammo that they can use as opposed yeah, to exactly. you're right the, the self-serving kpis oh marketing did blah 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 don't care not listening blah 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 but yep. no oh I, new case study i can send to customers that are facing migrations and doing this and that right. oh okay very cool okay right. And just right. maybe, maybe they might actually use it then and, and, and get some content activ- activation going, not just creation. Correct. Yep, exactly. Well, this is, yep. this is awesome. You are a sage of all things. I could see how <laughs> just, just by having some conversations, just the, the experiences are flying over here. So my, real, my next question fun. is, who are you? <laughs> yeah, who am I? <laughs> Who are you? How did you become this wizard of the high school? Yeah. Season? Well, you know, it's funny. We just were talking about uh, Isis. I did not get into this role from a traditional path, this, any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I wrote software for 20 years. I loved writing embedded software for the first huge chunk of my career. Um, and I caught a bug when I was um, actually uh, out doing field software development for, uh, for uh, a company, you know, going out to the customer site. Yeah. I kind of fell in love with the whole, I, you know, I would like to get out. I'd like to travel. I'd like to go um, far off places and meet new and interesting people. And um, that led me to product management. And then the product management led me to uh, more product marketing. And then um, just trying to watch some people that were very successful in their marketing role and, and emulate some of what they've been doing uh, eventually, you know, got me to where I am now. It, it's 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 a slow evolution of some 30 almost 40 years of a career yeah but it uh you know it's it's about paying attention to your surroundings and watching people that are successful and 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 just you know no good idea goes unstolen let's uh, let's put it that way sure sure you heard it here on the podcast right so so you started out in in the the tech space um how has that helped you in the the marketing world how has that yeah, no, it's a good question. So the um, interestingly, though, a lot of the st- the methods of that we develop software, you know, twenty years ago are completely obsolete now. But so you, you know, it's it, no toys about it. I could not sit down at a desk at this point with a software engineer and develop software. The tools are totally different. Languages are totally different. You don't use punch cards anymore, Alan. No, no, that's long gone. Even the you know the uh, the green <laughs> screens are long gone too. But but I will say, that, you know, some of the things never change. You know, for example. Um, Project management skills, right? Knowing sure. you know, how, why are, why are we allocating resources? What, you know, how do we put this together in a Gantt chart? How do we set expectations to the market based on the resources that we've got? Um, bug tracking, um, you know, all the methodologies that are used to manage the process f- um, folds into the marketing message because I can't announce something to the market if I know it's at risk from the development standpoint. Right. So being able to clue in to and get those little subtle um, messages sometimes from the development team is important. Um, and I think that's probably helped me a lot. And also, too, of course, knowing the technology that we're promoting, understanding how it works, because I've been in the same industry long enough, definitely helps. You know, that, you know, there's definitely technical terms that, you know, if, if used incorrectly, you sound like an idiot, you know. Right. So, and knowing the right terms and having the right, and it also helps right, land speaking sessions, right? If you've got some technical background and, and you've got experience in actually doing it as opposed to um, just talking about it. Yeah, it can be tough if you're just talking and you've got a lot of hot air. But if you're, if you're used, I think, I think the technical background, if you're used to going in deep Correct. on areas. Yep. You yep. can kind of yep. harvest that. And but you also, yeah, but you also have to know your limits too, right? Um, yeah. 
there's, you know, I work with some people who, t you know, know the technology inside out, and the trick is to is to leverage them, um, but don't fake it, right? Yeah. It's, um, hey, listen, I know it to this point. After that, we got to pull somebody in. Yep. And uh, don't fake it. That's for sure. So. Yeah, faking it. I remember once listening to uh, it was an interview process for. Uh, laser it was like a laser company they did lasers and spectroscopy and and wow. they had interviewed different people and when i was interviewing for a job there early on in the day before i was in human marketing and they were teach you something and then how do you teach it back to them so teach yeah. teach a bunch of phds all about what they've been studying for like 15 years Holy moly. after yeah. they've you know only shared with you for maybe an hour what you should know um, yeah and i remember it was myself and this uh, I think it was like a police officer or someone. Um, we were both kind of the finalists there, and they went with me over the other guy because when it, they started asking Q and A, <laughs> if he didn't know the answer, he kind of just made it up. Yeah. And something I like making up answers too, but in this particular situation, I was like, I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just going to, you know, if I don't know the answer, like that's a great question. Let me find out. Yeah. As opposed yeah, yeah. to blah blah blah, science wrong, science wrong, and. Right. Uh, and just trying to making it up. You, you gotta, you gotta go in, know the details, and be okay with not knowing what the answer is. Yeah, it's a lot easier to just d admit, you know, up front than get caught later. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that true? For sure. So, what, what in in the spare time? I think we were chatting earlier. You sure? You uh, spend time in the scouts? Yes, I do. In fact, I'm very active in uh, our local uh, Scout Council, the Greater Niagara Frontier Scout Council here. As a matter of fact, um, uh, yesterday I was on a conference call with people and I kind of explained, I said, you see that top shelf? That's all scouting stuff. This is all my technical books and then this is all my travel books. So that's me in a nutshell, is these three shelves. I spend uh, a lot of time uh, on scouting activities. We run a, a canoeing program here, you know, right here in, in the Western New York, Buffalo area. We're right on the Canadian border. So we yeah. um, have a canoeing program. We take scouts up into, uh, up in Algonquin Provincial Park every summer. We take about a hundred or so every summer to spend uh, a week in a, on a uh, canoe trip. And wow. um, yeah, it's a lot of fun and it, it produces, um, I think a great experience for a lot of these young men and women now that um, when I go to their um, boards of review or we go to their um, Eagle courts where they're being honored for their work, to hear them say that, you know, the highlight of all their whole scouting career was that canoe trip or was their backpacking trip or whatever it is. Um, it keeps me going. My two boys both made it to Eagle. They're, they're wow. both um, long since out of it, but it's, um, it's a great experience. I enjoy it. And um, now, now did you do it yourself? Out of trouble. I did. Yeah. When I was in, um, uh, well, you know, middle school, high school um, was a scout. I never made it all the way to Eagle, but I, um, I certainly left an impression on me. Yeah. Um, as as I went through it, and, and then uh, when my older my older son got to the right age, he kind of got signed up in Cub Scouts and yep. did the Pinewood Derby thing and did the uh, uh, summer camps, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Was, I think one of the his favorite ones was the Western themed one when we we made a big wooden wagon. Oh, the, like the, the Chuck, camp. Chuck Wood or the yeah, like a big Chuck wagon, yeah, Chuck yeah wagon covered derby, wagon. Yeah. yeah, so we had a lot of fun. Of course, um, you know, as the years go on, then you eventually get into much, you know, obviously high adventure activities and yeah, spent eleven days backpacking with them out in uh, Philmont Scout Ranch out in New Mexico. And wow, I have, I've never so. been to Philmont. I've heard a lot of things about it though. Yeah, yeah, it's a great experience, life changing, life changing. Now, uh, if I go and get my knees back, it'd be another uh, story. That's the thing. Right? So, yeah. Man. Yeah. It's not the uphill that kills you. It's the downhill. It's the downhill that kills you. It's the walk down from the tooth of time. It's yeah. it's punishing. Yeah. Jeez, jeez. You know, you yeah. mentioned the Pinewood Derby, and, and I was just doing that recently with my son, John. He's a yeah. Tiger Cup, so he's like yeah. and into the, new into the thing. And it was a nice balance of, like, dad wants to have fun and help make this car cool. Because I remember being a kid and – and my dad <laughs> helping out with that, but then also, okay, it's you know, it's his car. Let him right. do his thing, right. and um, yeah. So uh, we actually yep. got it. Um, you know, his, his color, his design, and and we got it all smooth and amazing. Now I may have ordered a little tungsten weights to, to go into the yeah. to the proper placement <laughs> of the car from some blog reading, but yeah, right, right. It's a nice balance. 
but you know what? The, we had our impound night was our last uh, pack meeting, and then oh, good. this thing happened. So our cars oh, have been impounded. Oh no! They're yeah, somewhere, right. and yeah. and no race yet. Uh, we'll, we'll look forward awful. to that though. When, when sort of the yeah. dust settles here, we'll be able to yeah go yeah. out and do that. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it, but yeah, you're right. All those Pinewood Derby events got canceled. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, we're worried about our summer, obviously. Yeah, you know, yeah. We're worried about our summer program, and we're still buying food and doing the reservations and all the paperwork to get the scouts up there this summer. But um, we're crossing our fingers that by July or oh, August. not summer camp, like the, the Algonquin trip. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. In, in July and August. Yeah, wow. yeah. So, yeah, we'll we'll make do, and then and of course. You know, our industry, telecommunication industry, is doing its best to help people through yeah. this time, right? You know, and obviously, yeah, platforms it. like we're on Zoom today, and yeah. some of the other platforms are are seeing you know unprecedented growth in their subscribers and uh, usage. Um, and it's, it, if anything, I, I've been post out a couple of tweets when we get some metrics back from our customers. You know, we've been tweeting out with a hashtag is that you know telecoms is hashtag part of the solution. Yeah, so just just want to recognize the you know the investment work that went into some of the stuff that now we didn't know this is coming um but how it's benefited keeping families connected together you know letting medical professionals communicate with their with their patients remotely right. and keeping people safe and um and healthy right mental health too sure so oh, um, we're just lucky that we we're in a situation where we have this kind of infrastructure today cuz 10 years ago it would have been you think about it it would have been ugly it, oh yeah it much worse Ch tell people to stay home and not have face time and not have video calling and not have conference calls and those kinds of things and be stuck it, with the crummy stuff on tv and yeah. i think we at least we had netflix but man could you imagine you know no no, no. no disney plus no netflix no and we're i know just on dial-up modems you know and having <laughs> to stay at home oh my goodness you have mail yeah oh my god i have mail great or 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 imagine yeah. back if this happened back in the day when aol was still charging per hour oh you know? yes oh my god everyone loses right. money except for aol <laughs> yeah <laughs> Who, exactly yeah quadrupled their stock or something right right, right wow right. yeah you're right it is, it is um fortuitous timing to to be in a, in a time where the telecom industry has really gotten us to a point where we can have these virtual conversations and get our social you know, our social needs and wants right. connection. Um, right. Yesterday was actually my son's birthday. And um, my wife did this amazing thing where she lined it up where um, grandparents and friends of the family and other people, every, uh, every hour, someone FaceTimed my son. And oh, how nice. Couldn't do the party at the fun world place, but you know, we right. could at least um, have people calling in that way. So. Oh, that's amazing. great. That's great. Well, let's, um, It'll make it makes a um, a crummy situation as good as possible. Let's put it that way. Yeah. 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 You gotta make as much lemonade as you can, right? For yeah. Sure. Well, sure. well. Tell me, where can people connect with you if they want to reach out? Learn sure. Do, yeah. No, I'm pr I'm very active on, on LinkedIn. Um, you just search for me. It's Alan D. Is David Percy. Um, okay. you just search for that, and you'll find me. There's another Alan Percy. Is a doctor in Chicago. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> not me. Yeah, or if they want to drop an e drop an email to me, um, my uh, Telco Bridges email is Alan dot Percy, P E R C Y at telcobridges dot com. I'd be happy to, you know, connect with folks. Look forward to it, and uh, always, you know, uh, I love swapping stories and sharing ideas, yeah. and and there's always um, that's all how how we stay sane. So. It is, it is, and and if you're gonna do that, people, don't be a creeper. Yes. Our suspected B2B lead gen person. Uh, yeah, those they, hey, drive me on nuts. The podcast. Oh, don't they? <laughs> oh, they drive me nuts. No one's original. No, no. I know. In fact, I, I, I tell you a quick story before we finish yeah, yeah, up yeah. here. I was on a flight um, uh, a couple years ago, and I was sitting next to a gal, um, young, young gal, was a college student, and she pulled out her, her um, textbook, um, was on marketing automation. And I had just read the same book. You know, I had just read the same book. What book? Is it a textbook? Uh, yeah, it's textbook on marketing automation. Yeah, um, and wow. uh, somewhere in the, that shelf behind me. Okay. But I, cool. So I uh, struck a conversation with her about it, and and she said, "Oh yeah, yeah, we just got to um, the you know how to use social media module." And of course, the book was a little out of date. Right? Yeah, yeah. From, from <laughs> I was gonna say textbook. Yeah. The textbook was a little out of date. So she said, yeah, her professor had just told her this. Um, um, they're supposed to do this routine where they're supposed to reach out to all the people in their industry 
in, in a particular industry and um, get connected to them on LinkedIn. And I said, oh, that's where all those LinkedIn, you know, you get those LinkedIn invitations from says, hey, um, I noticed we're in the same industry. We should connect. Um, and it's, uh. clearly this young person is, you know, a generation and a half younger than me. <laughs> right. They don't even tell what industry they're in. They're just in the same industry, whatever that is. Right. And there's no personal connection information whatsoever. It's no like, oh, we we crossed paths at this trade show, or I was on your webinar, or I was listening to one of your podcasts, or nothing. No connection whatsoever. Yes. And now I just I ignore all those. If you yeah. don't tell me where you cross paths with me, goodbye. Absolutely. Um, Unless you have like Prince in your name or <laughs> Duke of something in your name, you, goodbye. Right. So, and and uh, by the way, if their headline that you can barely see a glimpse of says, we help B2B companies generate more leads. Yes. Sending you a message, you're the lead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you exactly. connection. You're a lead now. Yeah, you're not yeah. – uh, you're just yep. out of connection. Uh, yeah, no, those are if it's business development and their and their title or any one of those things, it's just goodbye. So it's sad. It's sad that we have to do that. And uh, and for years with LinkedIn, it was nice because you could be able to, you know, you could really genuinely build a community, right? Yeah. And uh, um, it's gotten a little, it's got a little um, messy. Say the word. Pretty sure there's a level in Dante's uh, hell. Two point for LinkedIn spammers. Yeah, LinkedIn spammers right down there. Along with, by the way, the Skype spammers. They're down there too. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I got yeah. rid of Skype. I replaced it with Slack. Yeah. But um, yep. yeah, I hear you. They get were the right. worst. Oh, get out of here. Yep. So Crazy. anyway, but yes, I obviously love if folks want to reach out. I'd be happy to just say, you know, caught me on on uh, on Casey's um, podcast. I'd be happy to um Connect share up. thoughts and all with people yeah 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 share experiences and you know, next trade show um you know it'd be worth even just swinging by checking out your booth to really learn from what you've prepared yeah i can't wait for a trade show i know <laughs> i know me too man me too i was like come on get me one get- i could buy a drink for somebody it'll be like a momentous occasion <laughs> put me in coach can i shake yeah, your hand exactly. are you okay are we good yeah. with that now right right maybe right. next year yeah, um, well, I was at an event in Mo- the first week of March in London, and it was all elbow bumps. Yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Really? First yeah. week in March. So first week of March, kind of yeah. toward the tail end. Of right that. at the tail end of it, and we yeah. all s- snuck out of there and did, whew, you know. Wow. Yeah. You know, um, family and I uh, did a cruise last week in February for school break. Wow. It was like it was great. Yeah. No big deal. We washed our hands all the time. And they, they, they're good about it. They have this hand sanitizers and stuff. And yeah, sure. sure it's fine. Sure. But yeah, the idea of being stuck on a cruise ship, I could think of worse, <laughs> worse things. Unless everyone's sick and it's moving around a lot. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah. I, I'll, be at the, I'll be at the Lido deck. I'll be at the pool. Right. Like, getting right. some more drinks today. Oh, shucks. Well, then they lock it down, though. That's what's like, oh, boy. That's that true. room would get pretty small pretty quick. Oh, that's true, actually. Yeah. And their yeah. TV's terrible. So, yeah. Uh, another. Yikes. Yeah bunch of channels selling you things that old people buy so <laughs> yeah yeah well this has been great man i mean yeah thanks for coming on here just i hey look, appreciate you having me and it's really good get, get to know you and i i can't wait to get to meet some of your community yeah absolutely i mean this has been fantastic i've learned a whole bunch and uh for those out there listening if you've learned something and i know you have because i literally have two pages of notes over here then share this episode with someone be a thought leader to yeah. one person, two people, yeah. thousand people. Just share information and be the person that, that teaches other other people what you've learned. So get this out there. And again, Alan, thanks again for coming on here and, and hacking it up. Great. Look forward to hopefully doing a follow up someday. Absolutely. And in person one day. One yeah, day, fingers crossed. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Thanks again. And, and for those listening, this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. We'll catch you all next time. All right, a big thank you to today's sponsors, Cheshire Impact, helping marketers and sales win, maximizing the use of Pardot and Salesforce. And a big thank you to Qualified.com, the number one live chat and chat bot platform for Salesforce and Pardot. Remember the giveaway, if you have Salesforce Pardot and you want a free copy of my book, Marketing Automation Unleashed, then you go over to Qualified.com, engage in the chat, Do a demo and tell them that Casey sent you and that book will be on its way to your door. 
All right. We'll see you all in the next one.